Good morning. Um, I have a quick question before I launch into what I have for us today. Um, how many of you guys like roller coasters? A few of you? Okay. Um, so if you don't know me, my name is Johnny Arena. I get the privilege of leading the youth ministry of a bunch of amazing volunteers that help teenagers love and know and follow Jesus a little bit more each day. And um, I am kind of a thrill junkie. And so I absolutely love roller coasters. But long before I uh, got my first taste of a roller coaster, I was doing... St- stupid and crazy things. Um, I remember, uh, so I grew up in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas of California near Lake Tahoe. It was awesome. But I remember being just a a little guy hopping in one of those little red wagons with like two or three of my friends and bombing down these hills, uh, just going like 30, 40 miles an hour with nothing but that little black handle, uh, separating us from the right of our lives from the last right of our lives. Now, I don't even know how we survived, let alone, I don't think we even got any bumps or bruises really, but um, I didn't slow down as I got older. When I was in fourth grade, I actually uh, tried to jump off the staircase of my house with a a sleeping bag as a parachute. Uh, Spoiler alert, it doesn't work. Um, I ended up breaking my ankle and I actually, I literally wouldn't slow down physically. They um, put me in the cast for six weeks, but when six weeks came up, they said, hey, um, have you been running on this cast? And I said, no, no. Um, But the bottom of my cast was worn off and the truth was out there. Um, I had been running, so they put me back in that cast for six more weeks. And it it wasn't until I was about um, 12 years old or so that I got my first taste of what would become one of my my all-time loves, roller coasters. So if you've not been on a roller coaster, hang with me for just a second. But roller coasters are amazing. I remember we went to Six Flags Vallejo out in California near San Francisco. And we, uh, I went on my first roller coaster. I think it was called Roar. It was one of those wooden ones that like yanked you back and forth so hard that even as a 10-year-old, you kind of needed to chi- visit a chiropractor. And uh, I was absolutely in love. Um, and so I, I started on this, this road where I had to go on every roller coaster that I could get near. Um, We visited pretty much everywhere in California that has a roller coaster. I went to Six Flags up in Vallejo, Six Flags Magic Mountain, Disney California Adventures, Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm. Um, I even went to uh, state state fairs and county fairs and all that just so I could get another taste of the the ripping and riding the up and down the loop-de-loops. I had to have it. I was in love. There's honestly not a whole lot like a roller coaster either, um, all the way from waiting in line and feeling the, the tension of like, oh, what's, what's up ahead, to when you actually get strapped in, and you're like, oh, well, I guess this is it. Um, I hope these things work, to when you're climbing up the thing and you hear the clicks and you go, oh, gosh, I, I don't know if I actually want to do this anymore. And you get to the top and there's that stall where you look out and you go, oh, this is actually really pretty. I can see for miles and miles. And then, and then it lets you go and you start going. And then you go twists and turns and this way and that way, and it is a wild ride. And if you're lucky, the person next to you actually passes out. And at the end of the ride, you can get that picture with them. And you go, ha, ha, you passed out. Um, It is wonderful. I love roller coasters. But you guys didn't uh, come here today to hear me talking about roller coasters. Um, We're going to talk about a story in the Bible of a guy who had a roller coaster of a life. Um, This guy, his name is Joseph. And if you were here last week, Pastor Corey introduced us to this guy, Joseph. Um, Joseph was in the Old Testament. Um, He had a dysfunctional family. Again, if you were here last week, if not, go on YouTube, it's there. Um, But just Joseph had a really messed up family. His dad was kind of the king of the mess ups. Uh, He actually cheated and lied and uh, manipulated his brother out of uh, their birthrights. And when uh, Joseph's dad, Jacob, went to go marry uh, a woman named Rachel, um, he actually was uh, lied and manipulated and he ended up um, accidentally marrying her sister Leah. And so this all crazy dysfunction started and uh, Jacob ended up, Joseph's dad, ended up having 10 kids by three different women and Joseph was five finally born to his mom, Rachel. And so Joseph enters into this, this dysfunctional family, and we, we start this roller coaster ride, and it starts off really wild. So if you, if you don't, don't know the story, um, Joseph was uh, the youngest of the brothers, but he was the favorite. So his dad s- spoiled him with all kinds of stuff. And so his brothers, which uh, I, I, I don't know if you have siblings, I have an older brother. He uh, would not have taken kindly to my mom or dad spoiling me like they did uh, Joseph. But they actually, Joseph actually also had a dream that God was going to bless him, and he was going to have all 10 of his brothers bow down to him. And so, I, again, I, as a little brother, I think that's kind of funny. Uh, but if you have older siblings, if you are an older, older sibling, you wouldn't take kindly to that. So uh, the brothers, they got together and they conspired to beat him up and sell him into slavery so that they didn't have to deal with Joseph anymore. And so that is where we're going to pick up our story today in Joseph's wild ride. See, Joseph, before we get to what we're going to be in, in chapter 30, 39 of Genesis, Joseph is at the top of the ride. He is so excited. He's looking out like, man, my dad loves me. My family is doing awesome. I'm going to have everything go my way. And then 
down it goes. And he, he takes off on this roller coaster of a life. So we're going we're gonna, to uh, jump into Genesis chapter uh, 29, with, if you're with me, um, in our Bibles. And we're going to read what happens as Joseph's wild ride takes off. In verse 1 it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian who was one of the Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of the Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything that he owned. From the time that he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on um, everything that Potiphar had, and both in the house and in the field. And so Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care. And jo with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything but the food that he ate. Now, let's pause for a moment because um, for most of us, and I, I hope this is most of us, we, we don't really relate a, a lot to this story because um, I, I can't relate to being beaten up, sold into slavery, and sold into a government official's house, and, and I, I, can't, I can't relate to that. But we all kind of have something that we can relate to in, in uh, the dip of the roller coaster. When Joseph hits the bottom of the roller coaster, when he hits, it goes down that hill and he just hits that dip, we can relate to that. Now, we can't relate exactly to his, his situation, but we've all been at the bottom of a roller coaster. Maybe for you, the bottom of your roller coaster, it wasn't something major, but it was something maybe at work, you, you blew it on a work assignment. Or maybe you said something to someone you care about and you hurt their feelings. That's, that's kind of like the bottom of a roller coaster. Maybe for you, it's a little bit bigger. Maybe the bottom of your roller coaster looks like you're so stressed and overworked that you don't even know what day it is. Maybe your finances are so tight that you can't even plan for next month, let alone retirement. Maybe the bottom of a roller coaster for you is something even bigger. Maybe you lost your job or you lost a loved one or someone you know and care about is so sick and you just, you feel it and you're at the bottom and you don't know what to do and you can't find a way out. We've all been there. In some form or another, we, we've all been at the bottom of a pit. We've all been at the bottom of the roller coaster waiting for the next time to climb back up, waiting for this thing to keep going. And if you're like me at the bottom of that roller coaster when things just look rough, you, you raise your hand and you look for somebody holding the roller coaster saying, hey, can I get off this ride, please? I don't, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be on this wild ride anymore. And this is where Joseph finds himself at the beginning of this section. At the beginning of this story, he's at the bottom of his pit. His family has betrayed him. He, he knows nobody. He's in a foreign land. He, he owns nothing. He has no friends, no nothing. He's at the bottom. But there's something that we can learn from, from Joseph here that I think is so applicable to each and every one of our lives. See, when Joseph is in that spot, um, he, we, we see him struggling, but he does something super, super big. And it's honestly a big part of it. It has nothing to do with what Joseph did. See, there's, there's five words in there, and they're going to be on the screen in verse 2. The Lord was with Joseph. And I, I, I bring that up because no matter what Joseph did, he had the Lord with him. And, and these five words are such a powerful statement. They're actually some of the, the most defining words of Joseph's life. The Lord was with him. See, there wasn't a darn thing that Joseph could do to get out of the bottom of his roller coaster. There wasn't a darn thing he could change, he could modify, he, could do, he couldn't do anything. But the Lord can. And where Joseph couldn't make a way, God did. And this is the same for us. Wherever we are in our roller coaster ride, top, bottom, middle, or neutral, or upside down, the loop de loop, when we can't make a way out of it, our God can. And that is the, the defining metric of Joseph's life. And it's the foundation for everything that we, we are going to talk about in this series and in, in today's message. Um, Joseph's life was in a downward spiral, but the Lord was with him. And what he did in this moment is something that I think we can all apply every single day of our life, is in that moment when he was at the bottom, he looked to the Lord. See, he could have been a bitter, angry, unpleasant person, but what he did, he said, I, I got nothing, so God, I'm going to do what you have me to do. I, I, he looks to the Lord, and he starts looking to the people in front of him, the people around him in jail and people around him at that household, and he says, I'm going to love you. I, no matter what, what's going on, no matter what's been happening to me, I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to look and serve you as if I'm serving my God. And what he's actually doing here is he's actually uh, modeling for us something that the Apostle Paul says to 3,000 years later in the book of Colossians 3. If you've got the app, it's in there. It's not going to be on the screen. But the Apostle Paul talks about this kind of attitude, this kind of um, way of living in the midst of wherever you're at in your roller coaster. And he says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 22, Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything, and do it not only when their eye is on you to curry their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord. As a, uh, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. 
It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Now, I want to be clear here. It wasn't Joseph's work that was saving. It wasn't things that he was doing, but it was God stepping into his story. See, it, it's super stark. One day, Joseph, is, is, he's nothing. He's, not, he's barely a piece of property. And the next day, he's running the show. And the thing that changed was God stepping into his, into his story and choosing to bless everything he did. See, God chose to say, Joseph, whatever you do, I'm going to bless it. And so Joseph, he starts doing all kinds of things. He starts working and serving and loving others. And God said, every time you do something, I'm going to bless it. And so there was a whole heck of a lot of blessing in this situation. And so, so often that when we find ourselves at the bottom of our roller coaster, we, we, we do something else. We don't just start um, looking to the Lord and serving him in any way we can. We, we often get stuck doing one of two things. Um, some of us get stuck looking backwards and we, we start dissecting what went wrong. How did, I, how did I get myself into this mess? What are all the things that I, I did to make myself fall into this pit, to, to hit the bottom of this roller coaster? And we get stuck looking at a past that we can't change. Or if you're more like me, you don't get stuck in the past more than you get stuck looking to the future. And what I mean by that is we, we start jumping into action mode and we start doing everything we can. We start um, looking up YouTubers or calling people that know more than us. We look how to DIY the project ourselves. We throw money and time and energy and we, we, maybe we change our jobs. Maybe we change our relationships just trying to manufacture a future and we try to will our way out of this mess. But what we see in Joseph's life is that it's not looking backwards that fixes our problem. It's not looking forward that fixes our problem. It's looking upwards. See, the path out of our mess, it's, it's not what's behind us or what's backwards or what's forwards. It's, it's looking upwards. See, Joseph models for us this foundational piece of our faith that wherever we are in our walk, in our ride, in our, wherever we are, the, the key to get out of it is to look up. Now, it's kind of a cliche, but it is so true. Wherever you are, the God of the universe is right there with you, waiting for you to turn to look to him waiting for you to look and say, God, what do you want me to do? How can I serve you in this moment? How can I serve you today, right now? How can I serve you by loving this person? We see all throughout scripture examples of people looking upwards and not backwards or forwards or any other way, but towards the Lord. And we see it in uh, Nehemiah, if you don't know his story, he was one of the uh, people in uh, Israel when they got taken over. And he said, God, what do you have me do? And he went to Israel and he said, you know what, God, you, ha you want me to, to build up this nation again? I'm yours. And we see it in the New Testament with the apostle Peter when on the night, after, or the night that he betrayed his best friend Jesus, he said, God, I'm, what do you have me to do? And we see it with the apostle Paul and all kinds of people throughout scripture. When they mess up, the first thing that they do is they look upwards and they look to the Lord and they focus on what, they have with him, or what the Lord would have for them. See, these, these people, they all had faith that their God was bigger than their circumstances. Their God was going to take care of them. Joseph trusted, like his great-grandfather Abraham, that God would take care of him, that God would have an answer for them. Now, um, that's all good and dandy, and I, I know it's kind of uh, trite to say, hey, yeah, just trust God and things are going to go well. And um, for most of us, as we kind of go through life, we get out of the bottom of our, our first roller coaster pit. We start going along, and you know what? I, it's, I got this thing. I, I'm looking to God. I'm having faith. I'm doing all the right things. I'm checking all the boxes. Then, then bam, out of nowhere, we hit the loop-de-loop, -loop and things go haywire again. And we're going to look back in the, uh, the book of Genesis at Joseph's story to see what happened for him because he had a loop-de-loop. -loop. See, something came out of nowhere. Things were going well. He went from the bottom of a, a literal pit of, from when his brothers threw him into a pit to he was the king of the household. And then all of a sudden, he hits another loop-de-loop. -loop. So jump with me in, back into back, verse 6. Now Joseph was well-built and handsome, and after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me, but he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except for you because you are his wife. How then can I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed or even be with her. See, way to go, right? Joseph, Joseph killed it. He, he, he didn't even flinch at the temptation. It's, it's amazing. Like, there are some temptations that I have that, may, that like that for me. I, I don't have to worry about that. But we all have temptations that we fall prey to every time, right? Some of us have temptations that are super massive and big, and some of them are small, and some of them are more trivial, and some of them are, are deep, and they, they just wreck us. We all struggle with temptation every time. But as we look at what Joseph did and how he handled temptation, we, we can't help but go, 
wow, that was, that was impressive. He handled that temptation. He navigated that temptation super well. And before I go too much further, I, I wanted to, to clarify something real quick because uh, um, there's a little bit of a misconception sometimes about what temptation is. Temptation itself is not a sin. Temptations are an opportunity to create space between us and God. It's an opportunity. Temptation itself is not a sin. We are all tempted in all kinds of ways. It says in Hebrews that Jesus himself was tempted to do wrong, but he didn't. And Jesus was perfect. He was sinless. And so therefore temptation can't be sin, but we are all tempted to do something. And um, I wanted to focus on two types of temptations today that I think we all struggle with. Um, Some we struggle with a lot, some we don't struggle with a whole lot, but there are two major categories um, that I want to focus on today in the temptations of distractions and the temptations of attractions. Now, I'm ADHD, which if you hadn't noticed, I'm ADHD, it's, it's wild. Um, I am all the time tempted to, to be distracted by something and just go off on a random rabbit trail or just get distracted and just lose my spot. But um, shi- uh, being distracted by shiny object and being distracted, that's not a sin. However, um, there are things that if, if they distract us away from what, what God would have for us, they, they cause a problem. It's, the distractions become an opportunity for sin because distractions, they take our focus away from God. See, if everything that we are designed for is to do what God has for us, if we are made to live in, in his path, then what we need to do is keep our focus on him to see, hey God, what would you have me do? And we go and walk into it. And anytime there's an, a distraction, it's an opportunity for us to take our eyes off of what God has for us and put it on uh, something else. Now, um, most of us, um, we have this device in our, our pocket called a phone, um, and it is the king of distractions. And uh, the distractions are everywhere, but this thing actually was designed by some of the smartest minds in history to make us feel like we need the distraction. And we, a lot of us struggle with that, but even if that's not your struggle, even if you don't have an issue with the phones, which first off, kudos to you. Like, I don't know how you don't get distracted by your phone. Uh, I had to turn mine on Do Not Disturb because I get distracted. But we all have opportunities to take our eyes off the Lord. We all have opportunities for distractions. Maybe for you, your distraction is work. And, and you, your work doesn't just stay at work. And when, it, when you come home, you're thinking about work and you're thinking about your coworker and how they said that one thing. Or maybe you've got a, a project that just rolls around in your mind and you can't focus on anything but that. Maybe for you, your distraction isn't work, but maybe when you come home, um, you have to flip on the TV and you, you turn on Netflix or Amazon Prime. Even if you only got like 20 minutes or half an hour, you can fit a show in there. Maybe that's your distraction of choice. Maybe if you're uh, like me, uh, you like sports. Um, go Niners. Uh, I th- not, not going to distract. Hey, that was a distraction. Um, maybe that's your distraction. You're like me. Uh, maybe you're a fan of the Diamondbacks. Maybe for you, your distraction is, is video games. Maybe, maybe you, like, uh, you, you, just make, uh, you got the MLB, the show, and you wanted to play that for just a few minutes, just, just to unwind. Or maybe your distraction isn't that, but maybe it's, it's something else. Maybe you, you like um, exercising a lot. Maybe you're all about eating healthy. Maybe you're all about something else. We all have all kinds of distractions that just want to take our attention away from the one thing that we need to focus on. And our lives are are full of these things that are intended to make you look over here and, and not on what God has for us. We are all so distracted all the time. And I, I want to be clear, these things in and of themselves, these distractions, they're not bad. There's nothing wrong with being a fan of a football team. However, if that is keeping you from doing what, the, what God has for you, if that's keeping you from loving your family well, if that's keeping you from spending time with the Lord, if that's keeping you from going out and, and being with your neighbors, then maybe you need to reevaluate what's, what's distracting you and what, what is keeping you from what you should be doing. Now, some other uh, things that we struggle with, the temptations, um, it's not so much distractions as it is attractions. And um, attractions are, are, they're a little bit more insidious. They're, they're, they're bigger. They're not just a look away. It's an actual pull away. And um, uh, they're kind of like this a magnet. And um, we get, you get close to these attractions and they actually pull you away. Um, I, I, just, I describe it like this. Attractions take us physically or emotionally away from God. And we we all struggle with some sort of attraction, these major ones. Um, some of us struggle with them more than others. Um, some of us struggle with all of them. Some of us only struggle with one. But in some form or another, we all feel the pull, this, that, this magnetic tug away from what God has for us and towards something that is not what he has for us. Now, um, maybe this isn't for you, and so I'm going to tell some stories that are not about you. But maybe you know the CEO that, um, that skims off the top and he, he takes a little bit of money that was meant for his shareholders, and he, he actually um, takes it for himself. And he feels the magnetic pull of towards wealth. Maybe for uh, you, you've heard the stories of um, an abusive spouse or an abusive parent who just has to be in control. And they, they, if you're in the foster care system, you've heard stories all too well. They struggle with the attraction, the temptation towards power. 
and they, they struggle with, and they, they feel the pull of power. They have to be in control. Maybe uh, you're like me, and you struggle with um, people looking at you and liking you, and, and it used to be called vanity, but I like to think popularity. You want people to like you. Now, we, it's not, in and of itself, it's not a bad thing, but if that pulls you away from what God has for you, that, that is going to be something you need to address with. And the last one is something I think we all kind of struggle with, at least on some level. Maybe, maybe your coworker or your friend has commented on something you've done, and maybe you, work, uh, you worked on something, and you're like, man, this is really cool. And then somebody goes, oh, that, you can do it like this too. And we all struggle with this, this sin of pride where it just pulls us away and makes it about us and not about what God has for us. And the, this, the major attraction that we deal with today is, is lust. And um, most of us have been around church for a while. You know that lust and sexuality is kind of a big talk, topic that we've talked about for generations in the church. And I actually don't want to talk too much today about these sins uh, and the, about these temptations towards sin. But I, I want to talk about what happens when we avoid them. How do we, how do we get out of the, How, when we feel the, the uh, distraction pulling our attention, how do we focus our eyes back on the Lord? Or when we feel the magnetic pull of these attractions, how do we, how do we get right? How do we get back toward what God has for us? And Joseph is such a wonderful example of how he did this. So let's hop back into his story. Verse 11, if you're with me. One day, when Joseph went back into the house to attend to his duties, and none of the household servants was inside, she, Potiphar's wife, caught him by his cloak and said, come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand, and he ran out of the house. And when she saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, she called her, hus- her household servants and said, Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to us to make sport of us. He came here to sleep with me, but I screamed. And when he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. See, this beautiful woman comes to him day after day after day and tempts him day after day after day and says, Come, be with me and don't focus on what God has for you. Don't do the right thing. And what Joseph does is he lays out this plan for us. He does something that I think actually we can all follow. He, has, he lays out these four super practical things that we can do when we experience the temptations, whether it's a small temptation like a distraction or a big temptation like these other ones. We can follow Joseph's example. We can follow the Joseph plan to avoid temptation, to get out of the situation that we find ourselves stuck in. The first thing that Joseph does is he states the facts. So he lays out the truth. He says, I'm not your husband. What you're asking me to do, that's what, that's what husbands and wives do, and that's, that's not us. Uh, the next thing he does is he states the fact that I'm a slave. Slaves and their masters don't do that. That's, that's not what slaves and their masters do. I'm a slave. You're, you're my master's wife. We don't do that. He also goes on to say that I'm trusted. My master trusts me. Everyone in this household trusts me. I'm not going to break that trust. I, I, that is a fact that I'm not going to deny. And the last thing that he does is he says it's flat out wrong. He points to what God has said in, in, in the past, and he said, this is wrong for me to do this with you. My God has told me what is right, and I'm going to follow that. Um, the next thing he does is he makes his intentions clear. He doesn't mince his words at all. He doesn't um, uh, beat around the bush. He doesn't kind of avoid the conversation saying like, uh, I'm just going to, no. He says, no, I'm not going to sleep with you. You're, that's just not going to happen. There's end, of, end of story. My, my plan is to follow my, my master and follow my God. That's it, nothing else. There's new, no, no two ways about it, no worm in your way through it. The third thing that he does is he avoids compromising situations. In uh, verse 10, we see that she came to him day after day after day. And now, um, this is me reading into it, but I, I see that as um, she kept trying and he set up a plan. He said, you know what? I'm not going to be caught in the house alone. I'm not going to be there where she is when it's just me and her. And so he went out of his way because it was an anomaly. It was weird for her to be alone with him in the house. So in, in my reading of it, he did everything he can to avoid being alone with her. He, he didn't want to have to even deal with it. He just put it aside. And the last thing he does is he runs. See, Sometimes when we're faced with something, no amount of arguing or complaining or even just straight shutting it down, it doesn't work. Sometimes some, something is in front of us that we can't avoid and we have to just run. And for, for us, um, I, I want to I be clear, if you're in a spot where you feel like you can't avoid it any longer, you can't put it off any longer, maybe you need to run. Now, I'm not saying that if your neighbor's flirting with you, you need to move. I, I'm not saying that if your boss is a jerk, you need to quit your job. I'm not saying that if you're, um, you see what's going on in the schools and you have to pull out. No, like those things, um, I'm not saying just automatically run right off the bat, but maybe you need to reevaluate and see which of the four things in Joseph's plan that you need to enact in your life. Maybe you need to make some things clear. Maybe you need to call out some truth. M- maybe you do need to run. Maybe you need to, to change your situation. 
See, if you were here with us, uh, me, last time that I spoke last year, um, I shared a little bit about my past. I, uh, I uh, went to a college in San Diego called San Diego Christian College. So during the daytime, I was a, a Christian college student. And then during the nighttime, I was everything but. Um, I was all about the party life. I was all about doing anything and everything to scratch that itch, to, to have that pleasure, to have that joy, to have that fun. See, I, I was um, actually living such a way that I had two friends within a matter of week uh, who had known me for two years, when I told them that I was a Christian, their, their jaws literally dropped. You're, you're a Christian? I, I've known you for two years and you're a Christian? Like, what? And so that, that for me, it was a wake-up call because I was in the midst of all of the distractions. I, I was distracted by everything and I, and I loved it. I looked forward to the distraction. I, I actually needed the distraction to remind me or to, to distract me away from how far I had gone from the God that I once proclaimed. I needed these distractions so that I didn't have to feel the weight of what I was doing. I, I was a, a, uh, an object of these attractions. I, I, I was absorbed by them. I let them take control of me. And I was right where the enemy wanted me. I was distracted away from God, far from him, and not even looking for him. And it wasn't until God stepped into my life and he used someone to wake me up to what I was doing, to wake me up and help me realize the truth. And my, this person, they helped me walk through the, G, the Joseph plan of getting out of this sin. And this person um, at the time was just my, uh, one of my really good friends from youth group that uh, we had grown up, for, uh, uh, grown up in the youth group together. And then later on, um, she ended up becoming my wife. So that was a really cool perk um, of youth group. So send your kids to youth group. Um, but no, um, this friend Emily, she helped me walk through the Joseph plan. She, she knew the truth about me. She helped me lay out the facts. She said, Johnny, I was there when you proclaimed to be different, when you proclaimed to live a different life. And she said, that's not you. This lie that you're living, we, we got to expose that lie and we got to be honest about that. And the next, we, uh, we made our intentions clear. She said, Johnny, do you want to do this anymore? No. All right, let's make a plan. You don't want to do that anymore, so let's do something about it. Let's make a plan. Let's get out of this mess. You've got yourself in a mess. You can get out of it with the Lord's strength and I'm going to be there with you. We... Um, we, we didn't have any compromises. She literally, like, we, we talked through the things and we, we looked at the temptations that I was going into and said, hey, if this is what's causing me to sin, what do I need to do here that I cannot compromise on? How do I avoid temptation by starting over here? And we made a plan. And the last thing we did is I ran. Um, she, she helped me. Uh, I moved from San Diego all the way back up to Northern California, about 500 miles. I ran. I ran from the mess that I was in. I, was ra I ran from the distractions. I ran from the lust. I ran from the, the, the popularity. I ran from all of these things so that I could get away and get back to the Lord. And she helped me walk through this. And we all need someone like that in our life to help us walk through the Joseph plan. And so as I did that, after I ran, after I walked through the Joseph plan, my roller coaster actually settled out quite nicely, at least for a little while. Um, I can tell you some stories later about how my life got twist turned upside down, not like the Fresh Prince, but um, it was wild for a little while. But my life settled down. But for Joseph, his ride was just getting going even more. See, um, I'm not going to read the rest of the, the, that story, but to summarize it, um, the Potiphar's wife tells the, her husband that uh, Joseph had slept with her or tried to sleep with her and was trying to do things. And so Potiphar, or Joseph, finds himself back in jail. He's back at the bottom of his, roller, or his, his pit. He's back at the bottom of the roller coaster. And that's where we're actually going to leave the story for today. See, next week, Pastor Corey is going to come back and talk about what happens next in Joseph's wild ride. But for, for us, whether your roller coaster is at the top or it's in the bottom or if you're in the middle of a loop-de-loop, -loop, we can look to Joseph's wild ride and look at what Joseph did and how he looked to the Lord. He, he saw these distractions and he said, no, I'm going to have faith and I'm going to follow my Lord. He felt the pull of the, the attractions and he said, no, I'm going to follow my Lord. I'm going to do what's right and I'm going to keep my eyes on what's ahead of me. See, your life might not be as big of a roller coaster as Joseph's, but it, 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 you can learn from his life. His, life as well. We can learn that in the midst of the roller coaster, we can always turn and look back up to God and say, God, I, I got nothing. Can you help me off this ride? And, and he's there with us. If you feel the tug of distractions to look away from what God has for you, don't look away. Look up. If you feel the pull, the tug of these attractions, whether they're big or small, if you feel them pulling you away from what God has for you, what God wants for you, don't, don't get pulled away. Step into the Lord. Step into what he has for you. Our God is a good God who knows how to take a roller coaster of a life and turn it into a life of meaning and of hope. Joseph's life is an example. My life's an example. Pastor Corey shared some stuff. He, his life is an example too. We all have roller coaster lives, but our God is good above all of that. So if you want to join me in prayer real quick, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. God, thank you. 
Thank you that you are there in the midst of our roller coasters. Thank you that you are there when we are tempted. God, you say in your scripture that you give us a way out of temptation every single time. And God, we are so grateful for that. God, we ask that we have uh, a faith like Joseph's, a faith that looks to you when we struggle, a faith that says, I don't care what it costs, I'm gonna follow you. God, I, I pray that as we look at, at our lives, at our roller coaster, we see where we're being tempted, where we're being distracted, and we, we, we call it out. We lay out the truth and say, God, I'm gonna follow you. No compromises, nothing, nothing is gonna stop me from getting close to you. God, we love you. We are so grateful for you being at work in our lives, and we ask that you are there in an evident way. Holy Spirit, move. We are so glad that you're a part of our lives. In your name we pray. Amen.